So um, welcome, everyone, to my session, Who Cares About Drupal? How to Win the Hearts and Minds of Businesses. Um, I'm excited to be here, actually. Uh, my name is Imre van Meilig Meiling. Um, my name is um, totally not Dutch, but I am. Uh, I'm, it, it's, an, it's a privilege, actually, to be here. Um, I did the session at DrupalCon Helsinki a couple of weeks ago um, and tried it out there. Um, I want to share with you today um, some of the insights that I've, I've been gathering over the past few years when I came across um, several smaller and several larger companies that were adopting Drupal um, for reasons that might not seem obvious to many of us, right? So um, for me, I started UX development uh, quite some time ago, rolled into Drupal at version 4. Um, did some development, but I've been talking about it ever since the last 10 years, so I've not been into development, but I do have the background um, and uh, lay the link between the, uh, the technical folk and, um, and the project, as well as the client's needs and demands. And I've, I've had some, to me, astounding insights of what clients have been looking for recently, and, and to my mind, are looking for more and more. Um, so I've been uh, with Crimson before, which is now Wundercrowd, as you may know. Um, currently, I'm with Lime Green, Moorgrun. Sustainable websites, sustainable for us, means websites that are still perfectly usable five years from now for our clients. Um, I'm also involved in the Dutch Drupal community. I'm um, at the board of the uh, Dutch Drupal Foundation, and I've been doing Drupal Jam, our sort of local DrupalCon, for the past four years. It was very fun to do, very learnful, uh, intense, but also uh, very rewarding. Um, so for me, on a personal level, um, Drupal has, has many upsides that I've been uh, thankful for over the past few years. Um, I've been involved in, in projects for um, IKEA World Food Program, Port of Rotterdam, uh, amongst others. That, and it's, it's from those projects that I'll, I'll be sharing some insights with you. So. Growing the Drupal pie. Um, before I talk about that, I have two questions for you. Who, who, who of you in the room is involved in sales, pre-sales, consultancy? Raise your hand. Okay, good, good. So, uh, <coughs> and and who is who's uh, not into development? <coughs> Raise hands. Okay, right. So, just I know I um, do have the right presentation with me. <laughs> Growing the Drupal pie. Um, Dries has been talking about that. Um, in the past few years, which all means getting more business on Drupal, right? So when it comes to Drupal, we want more projects, uh, more clients adopting Drupal, getting new clients on board, getting different clients on board, right? And as much as I'd like to see open source spread among um, other types of clients, among bigger clients, um, what I see is that the values of community code, right, which we are about, is, is not, not longer the predominant factor of choice for many clients, especially clients that have been there for a couple of times, right? They have done their website for two or three times, and they've evolved to some um, next stage where they have, they have seen uh, the functionality, they have seen what the code does, and it, it's remarkably well, but they've, they've started to think in a broader sense, and they are seeking help in, in the area of um, return on investment, right? Measurable KPIs, um, digital strategy, and all sorts of online ambitions that, that they uh, get to the table with, that they seek help with, right? Even from us as, as, as shops. And I believe if we can somehow hook onto those sort of newer needs to us, it's, it's there where we actually win the hearts and minds more and more of businesses that we get to our tables. So when it's about growing the Drupal pie, I believe that we, we need to include those topics into the conversations that we are having with our clients. So what I observe, um, it's not just about the community. I mean, it's wonderful, right? And it is, um, um, <coughs> fortunately, on many occasions, it's a good factor of choice. But it's, it's, I mean, the community is unknown to certain clients that we get to the table. It's also no longer about good code. It still is, but not just good code, right? It's not longer about just functionalities, but it's they need more. They require a different type of help. They require uh, other expertise. It's also rational heads talking. I mean, we're all 
very rational people, especially when you're dealing with code. It's, it's, it's very binary at some times, but that's not where we always strike our potential clients in their hearts, right? That's not always um, a predominant factor for, for choosing us, really. And assumption is the mother of all fuck-ups. Um, I believe that uh, there are many assumptions that we still do, that clients still do, right? But also, when we talk to clients and do projects with them, we assume that they see the beauty of our community, they see the beauty of the code, uh, they understand the agile values and so forth. So I think there's many love and attention that needs to be going there. And it's these observations that I will be trying to um, sort of give you some insights in today, hopefully inspire you, and I'm, I'm very interested to hear from you how you experience those in your projects. Okay, so um, I'm gonna back up a little, um, a little philosophical spiritual truth that I've come to hold dear. Uh, it comes from a book that I've been uh, reading about a few years ago, reading the book uh, called uh, A Conversation with God by Neil Donald Walsh. It's not a religious book, but it has some very inter interesting um, perspectives on some very traditional uh, religious beliefs. And <coughs> the dichotomy between light and dark is fear and love, where there's different types of energy on the fear side that's very much about control, about contract, about scheme, about hide, right? Where the love energy allow and expand and are based on trust and so forth. Um, and I started to recognize uh, this dichotomy and started to recognize the, the various types of, of energies in, in that balance in all sorts of, well, both personal uh, scenarios as well as business, <coughs> where I, I uh, noticed that fortunately more and more people, even the business people and management that you get to the table, they have done it a couple of times. Of they, they do have good contracts, you should always have good contracts, but they just don't rely only on that side of the balance. So if you look at successful brands, um, you see that loyalty, loyalty leaders, they grow faster um, than their competitor average. And you'll re when you read about them, um, uh, it's interesting to see that those brands have come to, to gradually adopt the, uh, the, uh, the love elements and the love energies on the, um, on the dichotomy. And where tools are no longer a prime um, criteria of choice, but also other things like trust and cooperation and mutual success committing to mutual success, right? And they demand help from agencies, much like ourselves, not only building great functionality, but also offering um, services in the field where we can help them create their success, um, where we offer services or people, skills, uh, experts, whatnot, uh, in achieving their online ambitions, whatever they, they need to be. And I, I believe, I think that if we want to stay relevant in our business, um, it's perfectly all right. We're, we're very good at delivering these kick-ass websites. We have specialties, we have niches, that's, that's all right. And we can stay at that because focus is good. But I think we should also find people or, or gather them around us that are able to help us um, with other areas of expertise. So if you can create a slightly broader package in, in really understanding the online ambitions and needs of our clients, that's where we start to innovate service, right? Service innovation or service design, which is about creating a, a great customer experience, where the physical performance is, is as much as about the product and the website and the tools that we are um, set to create for them, right? Which we do very well. Um, we touch the senses with all sorts of additional cool stuff, uh, new technologies, AR, virtual reality, and whatnot but if we re can really raise the hairs on the arms of people, not just our clients, but also their users and their customers, that's when we touch them in their hearts and we raise emotions on all the touch points from the outside in, as, as Ries was mentioning, so where we've been years and years sitting on the chairs of our customers looking outward, um, we are gradually bringing in people these days that are um, willing to go out there, stand in that line experience what our, you know, what the users of our clients are actually experiencing and bring that outside experience in with us. So how do you create, how do you create that? Uh, how do you go about that? Um, first, there's the performance, which is the rational bit, right? Uh, where we create a kick-ass performance that exceeds expectations. Obviously, we do things very well and our clients, 
they say to us, yeah, it works great. And by the way, that extra feature that you threw in, that's awesome, right? So it's very much about product features. That's about quality. That's about price and all the, the criteria that we've come, you know, we're used to when we deal in RFPs and pitches and bring in new clients onto, uh, onto Drupal. Whereas the emotional focus is about the heart and we delight customers in a personal way. Not just our customers, but also their customers, right? And their customers create an experience where somehow we get to know that they say they know me, they listen to me, and they actually have the same values where people will say, wow, that's amazing, right? We all come across certain websites that we say, oh, wow, that's amazing what they did there, right? This is not just good, but they inspire us as well. Um, and that's, that's the area that I see uh, we need to be in more and more that clients see other experiences, see other projects, see other things on the web that they come to us and say, well, I want that experience as well. Help me create that. So the key question is, are you striving to be meaningful for people? <coughs> are you just trying to get that website done well? Or if I uh, sit down with clients, I ask them the fir first time, are you trying to be meaningful? Are you just trying to sell products, right? just trying to get your thing across. Uh, and this is an important question that we need to convince clients that we can think along the lines in, a in helping them ask this, this question, right? So does anyone know the, um, the example in the background? Have you seen that? That's Tesco, right? So <coughs> Tesco in Korea, uh, apparently the Koreans are among the, um, they have the, among the longest working days in the world. So they found a way where people can scan uh, <coughs> products with their phones, and even while they wait, the uh, the order is being prepped and such. That's a wonderful way how they really, you know, improve the lives of people, and uplifted um, a thing that they have in their culture into a good thing. So how do we know if the client is ready? This is a maturity map. Um, it, I'll, by the way, all the. Um, the sources are at the bottom of the slides if, if, if we put them online later. I, I really urge you to take a look at um, Altimeter. They have some wonderful templates for this. Um, this is the social business gover governance maturity map, but they, you have many maturity maps, but they all sort of cover the same things, right? When there is where you can map the state of evolution of, of your clients onto where they're at. It starts with ad hoc, where there's, they have a website, uh, but it's just, it runs. They have analytics, but they don't know the login onto a more sort of planning state where they, where they plan things and they have some form of governance but there's no coherence and there's no mandate for the people doing, doing the actual work, right? Onto formalize and so forth. And it does, does, it does not just involve the product, it involves people, false policy and so forth. And this is a great way to, to discern your different clients to know where they are at, you know, in their, in their digital lifespan, if you will. So <coughs> if you get a client onto the table that says, well, we have a website, but we don't do anything with analytics, and by the way, do you know if we have it? They're very much in that early stage, right? We see that a lot. It's, it's we, many clients are still in stage one or two, and I, I believe that for us as, as digital agencies, it's our job to, you know, to help them understand that they're there and help them make that next step. So I get many, well, many, but sometimes clients that have wonderful plans, right? Online ambitions, all sorts of things that we, we get happy from, right? It's, it seems like well thought, uh, maybe found someplace else, doesn't matter, but so, okay, if you want to be at that stage, um, if you want to really realize these online, uh, online ambitions that you put here, we need to get you to that uh, second stage, right? And it involves not just a kick-ass website, but you also need to do some other things about people, about policy, about processes, and so forth. So um, getting into the client's um, uh, state of need, you know, understanding, even though it's not your core business, even though it's not your specialty, but understanding that they're actually at that stage will, you know, will actually help form a proper answer for them and help uh, increase the chances of, of getting their success online because it will involve a different type of proposal for them. You need other things to be in there. So if we talk about success, what is success? Um, I, I, I'm involved in pre-sales consultancy as well, um, and I share my experience with the, uh, the people that, I'm, well, that we um, 
that we invite and, uh, and welcome. And the key question I always ask them is, what is success? Have you thought about what is success going to be for you in regards to the website? When will you be happy, right? Not just at Go Live, but a year from now. Have you thought about that? Where is it hanging on the wall? And if not, I urge them to take that exercise to think about success in a way that's measurable, in a way that you can hang on your wall and people will understand, not just management, but also the team, right? Because all the small decisions, as starting at the design phase, will need to serve <coughs> the, um, the, the KPIs that you'll, you'll be defining, the, the measurable KPIs, key performance indicators, the goals that you can measure. And what I call definition of success, um, I mean, of course, we can build a multi-site. Of course, we can build a great um, community with all sorts of users and rights and all functionalities, right? But what people will be looking at the site? Do you, do you know them? Do, are there different target groups? Have you spotted them already? Do you have some data there? Do you know what they need, right? Have you, have you um, investigated that? Because ultimately, that's what the site will be doing. And that's what we need to measure if it's actually working a year from now or half a year, right? So this is a model that we sometimes use, the ADA model. Um, they have several templates there that you can use and download, um, where A stands for attention, obviously, you know, the traffic. Interest is the long tail traffic, where you can actually see people sort of taking the right path on the website. Um, desire is getting to them into some funnel, right? And Obviously, action is like converting from anonymous to non-anonymous. Um, there's always data there, right, that you can sort of measure um, what's already there. Even, even the, the thinnest of data sets will help you um, get some benchmark of where your client is at. But there's different types as well. Um, obviously, um, I, I've seen actually the very measurable call where we had to decrease the number of defects from 47 to 12 per month. Um, others include the uh, time to market, right? How long it takes to, uh, to actually create a new user or deploy a new functionality. And believe it or not, there are still clients, small and large, that will, it will take for them a week to get a new, for them, for, for one of a client of theirs, to create one, one new user for their clients. So that's an incredible time to market, really that you're out there to improve. So if you can, you know, not just um, if you understand that this is what it's about, but also can bring in the help, or, or maybe uh, even from your own agency, um, help your, your clients in, in um, determining the KPIs that you need, hang it out on your wall, many things, uh, but, but these are one of the keys that need to be out there that everyone understands and that your team members are also able to explain to others. Uh, that's, that's where I see the glimmer in the eyes of clients that they think that they say, okay, um, this agency builds websites, they do well, but I understand that I need additional help there, right? And that's where we are, we're, while we're not actually having people on staff doing this uh, necessarily, we bring in other people that are able to do the conversation with our clients. So this is an example of a customer journey, right? Um, sometimes a scary word because it, it sounds complex. It, it is sometimes. Uh, there's many templates about mapping journeys, not just online, but the journeys that, uh, that clients do, you know, when they think over their website and they go to a real store and they then just, you know, turn away or cancel, whatever. And you can map all the soft points and the touch points and everything that they run into so that you can actually show to your client this is where we need to improve. I was looking at this, and we, we did um, in, in previous lives did this for, for in some projects. I found Dries' keynote from Austin, Texas, um, and his analogy remarkably helpful, where he is telling about the user's journey for making a photo, which essentially over the years just, just became simpler, right? The steps were taken out, it got shorter, shorter and simplified, Obviously, uh, uh, now only two steps, and I literally showed this example um, to, a, to a relatively large-scale enterprise project, which we won on Drupal, that um, 
um, converted to the, uh, to the webmaster's analogy because larger companies will have people on staff that need to be doing things themselves, right, with Drupal. So they used to uh, be doing all sorts of things. They needed to do all sorts of things to get stuff done online or on their website, which, you know, with the latest increment of Drupal has become just simplified or um, dis disintermediated, or just the middleman is taken out, right? Whether it's uh, some technical people, <coughs> whether it's an external vendor, um, I've had business owners and stakeholders come to me and say, okay, so I'll be able to actually create my own users or business rules. Yes, I'm going to show you in three weeks, right? And this is where you actually not only uh, get the rational arguments, but also touch them in their hearts because that's, that's where they get happy, right? So here's another example, uh, uh, more um, uh, daily, day-to-day um, -day thing um, about drag and drop, right? And this is a video reel that we show when we do pitches. And I was in a meeting a couple of weeks ago, and there were about seven people, um, like you know, the marketing manager and people from marketing and and people who were actually doing the content. And there was this uh, lady in the back, and she was very <coughs> quiet. And all of a sudden, she said, "Well." So I'll be finally able to you know, rearrange my own menu and drag and drop my, the items in my view. I said, yes, this is how it's done, right? And this is just, this is an example of, of one of our other projects. Um, um, they requested a real life example at the time, which we gave on the spot, a demo on the spot. But uh, she said, well, I'm used to WordPress and it works remarkably well. And now we have Drupal 6 and it's been a pain for so long. And when, we, when you actually show how, it, how it's done, and how you relieve also their pains, you know, even from the seemingly, well, um, people that are, you know, just doing the content three days a week. If you improve their lives, you're also going to make um, the lives of their managers, the, con the content managers and the marketing managers happy because there, there will be less people complaining about how they go about with CMS. So ultimately, all success hinges on people working together, right? Um, in human relationships, and I, I find that onboarding them in our ways of thinking is a great way of, of winning the, um, you know, not only the minds, but also the hearts of, of the business people, because they'll understand that they have found a party that's, that's, you know, that will take them by their hand, even though it takes a lot of time, even though we assume, you know, they, yes, we've done Agile a couple of times. Um, this is an, a, a great video, by the way. They also have the, um, the, uh, the image as a template, and we show that to them uh, on the, um, the remarkable uh, uh, responsibility of the product owner, right? Which is a very important role, as you um, uh, probably know, that worked for, for them. And I had the privilege uh, uh, at that time to work with a, um, an agile coach that was helping us out there who had no vested interest in the project. Uh, but if not, uh, I always urge our clients in our projects to at least do some sort of onboarding with us uh, to understand our ways of thinking, even though they have been, you know, having some experience with Agile. So um, this is about onboarding, um, a little bit about Agile MVP, minimal viable product, right? Um, it's always nice to have a client that understands what Agile is about, or at least, you know, the basic principles, even though they haven't had the experience if they know what MVP stands for, if they do have a backlog, that's, that's just you know, the very first step. Still, we see a lot of tendency to clients having say, okay, we wanna work at agile, but we still need to have it all in there, right? Which is basically not agile. So um, this is one of the hardest discussions that we have about minimal viable product, about you know, what, what you essentially need to get in business. No, that's a very nice feature, right? The uh, frequently asked questions, but you will do with a page for now, right? We can get online. And this is a lot of the discussion that we, uh, this, this is probably, you know, one of the, the single most um, um, uh, often taken off the wall uh, slides that I have that we bring down onto the table in the conversation. There is a side note there, right? Because um, there is many incre increments of this, many versions of this image. I haven't had a client that came for a car and went out happy with a skateboard. But that's not what it's about, really, right? I just want to make them understand. 
Um, what do you need to get in business? You, know, you need to get that conversation rolling. So if you can get your client to overcome um, the fear of losing scope, because squeezing it all in ultimately loses sco lose scope anyway, because we can't do it all right in the time or, or budget frame. So that works remarkably well. So this, you know, you bring this to the table. It sounds like a good story, but the real pain comes when you do your projects um, uh, gradually into their um, experience, which is, you know, where the um, the hearts and minds are. HubSpot is. Um, an American, um, I think American vendor of, of digital marketing software. I haven't used it, but I've, I've looked at it. I, I, I got the code culture, and there were some remarkable values in there that really, uh, um, well, um, resonated with me. And one of them is that they are radically and uncomfor uncomfortably transparent. And I'm, I'm a great advocate for transparency and, and you know openness, uh, and be clear about everything. So. If you have something in your project that has meaning, I, I hang it on the wall, right? I take it out, hang it on the wall for everyone to see, not just upper management, not just the team, but everyone, right? Because if, if it does something, why not take it out there? And I tell this to clients, even at our first meeting, you know, that, that we, wanna, we wanna be transparent. We don't hold anything back in some sort of risk management documentation or whatnot. If it has meaning, we take it out there. And it seems uncomfortable uh, at the beginning, but you know I've I've seen projects where, where actually you know the upper management of clients says, well that's very interesting. We should do that more often, right? Even in a way where the actual team who needs to resolve everything uh, understands it as well. A little bit about agile values uh, and about agile. Uh, I'm a strong believer in agile because many of the um, the values on the on the on the love side of the dichotomy. Like, like trust and, and, and cooperation are, are embedded in there, right? When I was young, I was with the Boy Scouts, um, and there was um, the Boy Scout rule, even though it's, it's well, uh, it's obviously based on, you know, on, on sort of military traditions. There are also very, some very strong values in there. The Boy Scout rule essentially says everything that you touch or pick up, you need to leave at a, at, you know, as it was or preferably in a better state. And I, this, an image like this was also on the wall because I, I, I found it remar working remarkably well where you know, not just our team, but also the client team come to us and say, look, um, you have the scrum board, but why isn't anything moving? You know, it's not clear to me. Well, it's clear for us. People say, right, the team says, well, we understand it. Yes, but it's not just for you. It's also for your client, your product owner, your stakeholders, right? So you need to leave everything. You know, it's, it's, it's for your peers, really. Um, and I find, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be this rule, but I find that, you know, getting out your, your core values that, that, that are really, as a human, uh, work for you well, have worked for you well, and illustrate on how you want to deal with others, uh, take it out there, express it, and hang it on your wall. Um, and I tell clients that we do this, um, uh, which is different than what they're used to, and it works for them, right, and their hearts and minds. So proper product development is perfectly okay because that's what we at Lime Green do as well, right? We're, we have a, a very strong specialty and we can have a very uh, good business for that years to come, all of us, right? But consider that you may need more to stay relevant and win the hearts and minds of businesses. So to sum up, um, expand the service design, combine great performance with customer experience to add value to people's lives, right? You don't have to do that yourself. You can form unions with people around you, people that you can trust. We've brought in some remarkable people um, uh, that we form partnerships with that are helping us uh, not just you know, create a kick-ass website, but to actually set a great customer experience. And in so doing, help grow the Drupal pie, really, right? So build on, on trust, not just contracts. And the contracts need to be there. I mean, I'm not saying uh, we should abandon the contracts, but also focus on trust and find, uh, recognize the clients that are, are, are willing to, to grow there, right? Even though they're very sort of risk and compliance, traditional contract regulated clients, if you can find clients that say, okay, 
but we also want to make success together. If you, if you can feel that their, um, the values are there, uh, try to help them focus on the team, not the terms. Um, okay, so ensure definition of success. So with measurable KPIs, um, everyone is able to understand, right? So not just your client, not just management, but also your team. Um, your clients will come uh, to demand more and more of you, not just help with a, with a good product, but also achieving you know, their online goals, their online revenue, and so forth. There's, there's, you may have a good group of sponsor in your client, but there's people around them that will demand at least some return on investment, that will demand to know how will we return the, the, our investment in a year from now. You know, when is the site going to be successful? Align that with digital maturity, right? So know where your client is at. So if you come you know, with customer experience and personas and journeys and so forth to a client that's not already there, uh, still you're going to miss that mark. Show, don't tell. Um, so go out there and meet the people, uh, live through their stories, stand in those lines, um, and, and show the examples on how you did that. You know, show examples on how you're going to make the lives of people easier. Say, okay, don't worry. Um, uh, the people from marketing or the people from IT, I'm actually going to help your content people, and I'm doing it like this. And there's so many stuff out there that will help you illustrate there. So understand what is needed and use what's already there, and there's so much. Live through projects as you live through life, right? So don't be afraid to express your core values, you know, not just as a company, but also as, as human beings forming a team. You know, among yourselves, um, we have many sort of these things hanging on our wall. But if I, if I get the chance and get to a, to a client premise and we do a project there, I hang it on their walls as well, right? Because that's our lives. So we express that. That's what we live through. Right, so, oh, that is in, that's away. Actually, that was my last slide. Anyway, that was my last slide. So, that was my wrap. Um, thank you. Are there any questions yet? Yes. Thanks. Uh, but before too much time goes by, there was a slide number three where you had some little uh, logos of five minutes, fifteen minutes, fifty-five minutes. I, I honest, I I'm, maybe I'm just slow, but I can't figure out what what that meant. Could you please explain the slide? Oh yeah, this one. <laughs> um, that is a good. Yeah, this is uh, actually it's as, um, as, uh, it's as meant as an illustration. Um, on on where you have like uh, the more uh, properties that you define, uh, the more granular uh, uh, definition of success that you have. Actually, I, I was trying to say make sure that you have thought about some measurable numbers, uh, but maybe the visual doesn't work very well on this one. <laughs> Thank you. Anyone else? Oh, yes, sir. Yeah. Um, how often do you compete with other group of jobs versus other companies that deploy different technologies? Mm -hmm. Because depending on who your client actually is, yep. the outcome will be different. Mm -hmm. Um, well, I, I, I'm, I'm not sure if, if this, if I'm be, be able to answer that, but uh, that's because we're a Drupal shop ourselves, right? So we're biased. I, I tell them that. Fortunately, we have a lot of business from, from companies that are either on Drupal or, or are considering it. I also have experience in, in the field where, where we weren't a Drupal shop per se. Um, there were other technologies as well, the right tool for the job. What I can tell you is uh, we came across a, a request from a client uh, two months ago that was totally not our thing and totally not Drupal. 
and I tell them that I say, well, I will consider it, but uh, I respectfully decline, ultimately, right? Because uh, Drupal is not the right tool, uh, and and we can make we can make it into Drupal. We can force it in there, but it's going to be so much heartache and pain for our people, which I don't I don't want to really. Is, is, does that help help answer your question? Okay. Anyone else? Yeah, I, it's a good question. Also, um, th there is there is there is many occasions that we're just further down the line and we just need to build according to specification, right? Uh, still, I ask them about okay, very nice, but what's the bigger scheme of things? Where is the online plan for that? Do you have the KPIs there? What what does it need to do, right? Uh, I ask about that, even though we're just five steps down and need to build according to technical specification. And uh, quite well, occasionally they have that, occasionally they don't. I say, well, we still can build this for you. Um, it's going to cost that, right? We're just doing a proposal. But uh, I'd also be very interested to, to, you know, to know about how you're going to make this into success. Obviously, I can help. Uh, you can find others that, that are able to help. But I, I do want to open up that conversation still. Yeah. Anyone? Yes? Yeah. I'm just, if you're allowed to talk about it, I'm dying of curiosity. What was that uh, client spec that would not have worked in Drupal? Yeah, that was a, um, uh, a municipal website that we built uh, in Holland. Uh, so the website um, is there on Drupal. There's a Drupal distribution for Dutch mun municipalities, and it works great. But then there is, was another division of the municipality that came to us and wanted to hook on to some ESB and an archive system. And um, they said, well, you know, the, um, the guys from, from communication and marketing, they have some great experience with you guys. We have this need. Can you also fit it into Drupal? Because we need to stay within, you know, a limited number of platforms. So really, the question was sort of steered to us by the fact that they want wanted it in Drupal as a sort of mandate, so keep keep everything within one framework as much as possible. Um, so yeah, we need to uh, to um, build a repository that would uh, disclose all sorts of digital digital scan documents really for the public. That was it. So it was dependent upon an integration. Uh, yeah. That relied on the shortcomings of something else besides Drupal. Uh, yes. Um, and also, there were there were many technical aspects involved that they wanted fixed price, uh, and we just didn't know about that at that time. So you know, as it goes with fixed price, if you need to involve that much risk, you need to increase the price and so forth. So so that didn't work out for us. Yes, sir. Um, in reference to things like show and hotel and so on, as you uh, and service design, um, do you see the role of Yeah. Yeah. As a as a as a as a Drupal agency, we have uh, several partnerships with design agencies, right? With agencies that do that. So we don't do it ourselves, but we understand the value. We say this is this is so so. Yeah. We we talk about that, but we bring in other people because we we see the value and we see the that the actual the benefit for the client. Um, there are some some Google design sprints that, that you know that they do in a week with rapid prototyping and such. Um, I've witnessed it myself uh, at one point. Um, so so not our people. We don't do it, but um, our our design partners do. Would you use Drupal for more functional prototyping? Because not all of it is visual. Like mm -hmm. Drupal for that. 
Mm, that's an interesting question. Um, often, uh, where we are at, there is um, you know there is a design. Clients want to see you know what's in the design. Um, when it's about the you know the back end and the CMS, obviously we, sometimes we do a demo, but it's all already a quite functional demo. But I wouldn't um, quite yet prototype a website just based on functionality because the the most clients just can't see through what's there, you know, and visualize the design in front of that. They want to see the design, clickable design. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I just didn't know if you progressed from that to something that's more and more functional as you go. Mm -hmm. It's um, just visual and then you right. build as you go, as you build it. No, we, do, we, we do have had some requests where we had to set up a demo, but we don't do that a lot, yeah. Uh -huh. building more application like applications with right. business logic and features and uh -huh. so on in a very short time scale where you can verbally explain, okay, well there's this part yeah. that could happen. That's true. Okay, well yeah. that's possible with the web kit that for now and yeah. that for long. And if, if If you have the scenario of the uh, of the business owner yeah. that's used to SharePoint and need and needs to be doing his stuff there for the past seven years, yeah. and you show Drupal and say this is how it, how you will be doing it this way, that will help. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, I think it's really important to manage expectations of how Drupal will improve something like that. Uh huh. Yeah, I see your point. That's interesting. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, yeah, we should do a, a discussion on that further. In the back, one more. Hi, so we serve, I'm getting a lot of requirements from uh, the existing Excel applications. Yeah. Okay. Does that as a situation where you I don't know I've given you enough context, but does that sound like it's a kind of a you line people in or would it that be quite a good fit? Um I that I wouldn't dare to answer. Uh I I, I, I definitely had have, have a lot of more questions for that to answer, but um if it's about content, I am um, we talk about content migration, we would talk about content uh pre production or content staging, right? And setting up an environment where, where your client is able to do things with their content, halfway the project, for example, right? Because if you're if you're if you're uh, putting in content from place A to place B, you need to start early with that, because uh, quite often it's just not just um, uh, a new website with the same structure, but the structure is different as well. So you need to map that content. It's 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 actually a sub project in itself, really. Um, I'm I'm not sure if that answers your question, but. Mm. Right. Yeah. But I, I'm I'm happy to uh, to think with you on that if, um, in the in the um, in the hallway later on, if you will. Yeah. One more. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because you think like you are in the in your company is in the position of uh, you don't 
Well, some of the keywords, I, I, I don't know about Asia as that much, really, but uh, it might be um, time to market. So we have a platform that we can roll out new functionalities real quick, right, with modules, with content. Uh, so you help those clients, you know, not just um, purchase like, like uh, expensive modules for expensive frameworks, but it's actually out there as open source. Uh, but you still need to pay, like, like you know, good people who will implement it, but you will be there quite fast. That helps. So obviously the licensing costs, right? Um, it's 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 cost-wise easy, easier to step in. Um, what also helps is um, there's there's the uh, no vendor lock-in deal. So uh, especially well, that's that's one of the things that I always say. Well, if if you're not happy, I mean, I'm not going to hold you. Uh, there's no point in holding a relationship where either of, one of, of us is unhappy. So if you want to leave, that's fine. Uh, obviously, we do our best to have you stay, but um, the vendor lock-in is a good buzzword for that. Um, yeah. And I also th I think it helps because uh, people will understand we're passionate about what we do, that there's people at the table that are very passionate about their product, but you also need to convince them that you're as passionate about Drupal as you are about helping them achieve their goals online, you know, sell their stuff online, and that know that you understand what needs to be done. That's basically my message. So something with why is good. Right. Yeah. yeah, the why, exactly. I see that we still have 15 minutes of the hour. So <laughs> if there still are questions. Lunch. Yeah, we need to go to lunch. <laughs> Thank you for listening, everyone. See you later. <laughs> Cheers.